Welcome to Friends and Fiction, four New York Times bestselling authors, endless stories. Novelists Mary Kay Andrews, Kristen Harmel, Christy Woodson Harvey, and Patty Callahan Henry are four longtime friends with more than 70 published books between them. Together, they host Friends and Fiction with author interviews and fascinating insider talk about publishing and writing to highlight and support independent bookstores. They discuss the books they've written, the books they're reading now, and the art of storytelling. If you love books and you're curious about the writing world, you're in the right place. Hi, everyone. Hi. It's Wednesday night, and it's time for Friends in Fiction. So let's get rolling because we have the best night ahead of us. We have several amazing guests to get to tonight and lots more to celebrate. What a month this has been, y'all. <laughs> I am Patty Callahan Henry. I'm Kristen Harmel. I'm Christy Woodson Harvey. And this is Friends in Fiction. Four New York Times bestselling authors, endless stories to support indie bookstores, authors, and librarians. As you can see, we are down a man tonight. Mm -hmm. Our Mary Kay Andrews is in London having fun. And if I'm a betting woman, she is collecting antiques. <laughs> <laughs> just, I mean, it's just a guess. I'm just getting right. something for us. You know, oh, right. oh, I hope she is too. Something with silver in it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so she's in one of my favorite cities and I'm green with envy, but I hope she's having a blast. And tonight we are welcoming our friends Kate Morton with her new novel, Homecoming, and Lee Smith with her newest, Silver Alert, and a Friends in Fiction community favorite, Susan Meisner, will be joining us for the after show to talk about her book, Only the Beautiful. Holy macaroni, as my granddaughter says. Talk about a blockbuster night. It certainly is. Well, we know our beloved Mary Kay is sorry to miss tonight's show. She's a huge fan of Kate Morton's work. And she recently told us a story about how Lee Smith's Fair and Tender Ladies provided a deep connection between her and her mother and all the female cousins who passed the novel around amongst one another decades ago. And of course, if you are a longtime Friends of Fiction follower, you know that Susan Meissner is a dear friend of all of ours. So it was a really sad week for her to miss. Yeah. But we wanted to remind everyone in her absence that this is a big week for her because it is the paperback launch of The Homewreckers. Yay. So if you have not picked up that book yet, make sure that you grab it. Um, even though she isn't here, buy her book, damn it. It's got to be said. <laughs> got to say it. And also, another big announcement, we pre-taped our show last week because of travel schedules, and so we didn't get to celebrate that our Patty's The Secret Book of Flora Lee hit the New York Times list for the second week in a row, and you guys, you can't even imagine what an achievement that is, so we all need to raise a glass. Here's to you, Cheers, Patty. Cheers, Patty. Cheers. Cheers to Flora Yay. Lee. <laughs> I got to tell you, it was amazing to do that, like unexpected and glorious, but not nearly would it have been as much fun if you all hadn't been there to scream into the Zoom and into the phone <laughs> with me? Yeah. Because what is something wonderful if you can't share it? So even though we didn't get to celebrate on the show, we got to celebrate with each other. We had an emergency Zoom. Well, and we, but we were on it for 45 minutes. And at one point, my husband came into the room and said, It's your night off from Friends and Fiction, and you're on a Zoom with Friends and Fiction. <laughs> like, what's wrong with you? I'm, I'm like, but They're my people. We have we're to very celebrate. codependent. Okay. <laughs> it was, <laughs> we're going to our next podcast. It's going to be on codependency. Exactly. Right. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that, ladies. All right. So, congratulations, Patty. We are so, so happy for you. you. We're so happy we Thank get you. to raise a glass with you last week. And that we just get to do it again. So that's great. So since our beginning, which was over three years ago, we have been here to bring you incredible authors like Patty, hot reads, and fascinating <laughs> interviews, all while supporting independent booksellers. One way you can help us to support indies is to buy from them when and where you can, or to visit our own Friends in Fiction Bookshop.org page, where you can find Kate's, Lee's, and Susan's books and books by the four of us and all of our guests at a discount. 
And speaking of amazing books, don't forget to join the Friends in Fiction official book club with Brenda and Lisa on their Facebook page. Join them tomorrow, which is May 25th at 7.30 p.m. for a happy hour with our very own Ron Block. And mark your calendars for Monday, June 19th, when Patty will be joining them to discuss The Secret Book of Flora Lee, which you may know from the New York Times list. <laughs> <laughs> We're just going to eat all the blood we can out of that one. <laughs> and yes, speaking of books. Oh, Christine. And speaking of books, our <laughs> books, this is the year that all four of us have new novels being released. Kristen's The Paris Daughter is out in less than two weeks. Kristen, we knew we needed to remind you because you've yeah. nearly forgotten. No, I had forgotten. I, I didn't realize. Yeah. This is, no. for everyone yeah. out there, this is a very, it's a very calming time in the life yes. of an author. Very zen. 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 Totally. There's very little to do. There Nothing. are not 47 podcasts <laughs> and 8,000 interviews <laughs> and packing of levels of which you can't really even fathom. Uh, you know, uh, it's for relaxed. Yeah. <laughs> there, there were not 380 books that were supposed to arrive to your house today to have you sign that didn't arrive. That didn't would never happen two weeks before. That would so. never happen. Although, on the bright side, <laughs> see, you took one for the team, speaking of our codependency, because I got a text today like, hey, we were checking in to like talk about those books, so I guess that's why, because yours well, didn't yes. arrive. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, you, but the first daughter is out in less than two weeks you guys if you have not pre-ordered this gorgeous book go order it it is so fantastic i read it like when i say i read it in three sittings that doesn't do the book justice because when i i didn't have like i would have read it in one if i had had like the whole day it was Thank so you, fantastic it's sweet. such a beautiful book um you will fly through it and cry and laugh and be changed and um, <laughs> thank you so order it go order it very sweet it's go time, time. Thank Buy you. her book, damn it, too. If Mary Kay's not click. here, I'm going to have to exactly. click, click. All right. And Christy's book is out in seven weeks, The Summer of Songbirds. Looking and both seven. Kristen and Christy have some incredible pre-order giveaways. So check them out on their author websites and their social media feeds. And with all four of us having new releases, we have some simply amazing events coming up as individually on our book tours and together as a group. So you can catch us live as a group nearly once a month this year, which we're so excited about. We'll be in Huntsville, Alabama on June 6th, less than two weeks from now, to celebrate the launch of The Paris Daughter. Then we'll be in Tampa, Florida on July 20th at Oxford Exchange for Christie's launch of The Summer of Songbirds. Then in Beaufort, North Carolina on August 1st for a breast cancer fundraiser. And last but not least in Darien, Connecticut on October 4th for MKA's Bright Lights Big Christmas. So make sure you are signed up for our Friends in Fiction newsletter and for our individual newsletter so that you're the first to know more. And you can also find each of our individual tour dates on each of our individual websites if you're interested in that too. All right, y'all, before we welcome Lee Smith, I want to personally just say real quickly to all of you, I am finally home after nearly a month on the road with book tour. And man, oh, wowzer, oh man, did you show up for me and for Friends in Fiction and for Floor Lee. And I don't even know what better words than thank you. Grateful seems a meager word for how it felt to see all your faces at so many of my 28 stops. So, all right now, it is time for our next guest, and I am so excited to talk to Lee Smith. Um, I loved this book, Silver Alert, and Lee is the best-selling author of several novels, including Fair and Tender Ladies, as well as four collections of short stories. She was born in a small coal mining town of Grundy, Virginia, where she began writing stories at the age of nine and selling them for a nickel apiece. Which is I love that. I love that. <laughs> I wonder what those stories are worth now. <laughs> I, I know, right? <laughs> Her novel, The Last Girls, was a New York Times, best Times bestseller, as well as a co-winner of the Southern Book Critics Circle Award. She's a retired professor of English at North Carolina State University. She and her husband, journalist Hal Crowther, enjoy spending time in North Carolina and Maine. Her new novel is not in North Carolina or Maine. It is set in Key West. It is called Silver Alert, and it was just released last month. Sean, can you bring Leon? Hi, Leon. Hello. 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 Hi. Hi, Leon. We are so so happy to see you. All right, we're going to dive right in. Lee, this novel is so funny and endearing and hard in places too. It's 
everything. And I listened to it on audio during my book tour. And I was so immersed in the airport that I nearly missed my plane. I absolutely adored all the characters, but Dee Dee is something special. She is charming and quirky and smart, and I want to be her friend. Um, on the face of it, this novel is about an unlikely friendship between an older man, his wife who is suffering from dementia, and a young girl trying to make her way into a new life in Key West. But Lee, we want you to tell us what you think it is really about. Um, I think it's about, um, it's about loneliness, maybe in a way it's about how, uh, we different parts of our lives, we become, you know, very lonely and it's about, uh, older people. It's about, you know, it's about aging. It's about things that we're all, I'm hitting, you know, it's a thing. It's, it's yeah. times that we're all hitting and it's about, um, a family, a family where the wife has Alzheimer's, the husband, Herb, is determined to care for her, you know, and determined to keep her at home, et cetera. It's a situation that I think maybe we've all faced at different times. Yeah. And, uh, you know, with people we know or people maybe in our own family. And so um, Herb is a mess. So he's just a mess. He has every bad attitude, every bad word. I mean, he is just and a, a potty mess. mouth. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, he's he's the when the um, the the readers, you know, that say say what you're supposed to have and not have. They just came all over her. They said, "Who would want to read about this man?" But you know, he's furious because he is aging because he's lost his power. He can't take care of his wife, and he can't make this not happen. So anyway, that's the situation in his uh, his household in Key West um, when he decides to call someone to come in and um, help, you know, a, a manicure, pedicure, et cetera, hair girl, because they won't let, they won't let his wife go into the, go into the salon anymore. She was too disturbing. And so the doorbell rings and it's Dee Dee okay. and Dee Dee turns out to be, she's a beautiful blonde girl but she's got a, a surprisingly uh, difficult past. History. She would never know from her brightness and her, you know. And she sings. She, in fact, she sings Susan to sleep after this first Manny Petty, Manny Petty, and then she becomes sort of a part of the household. So this has happened, and then um, the story, the main story of the book, though, it's named Silver Alert because. Uh, what happens next is that the family gets together, you know, the families get together and they decide what's going to happen, you know, no matter what Herb wants or whatever. And they, they, Susan has gone, Susan is taken ahead to the home to the Alzheimer's unit and Herb is supposed to be going too. But in the, 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 the busyness of the moment, he finds the key to his own car which his children have taken away from him. Of he finds it in an old golf shoe and he gets it. And the car is a Porsche Carrera. Okay. And it's locked <laughs> in the garage. And Dee Dee's come over to tell them all goodbye. And he says, uh, hey, honey, I'm going to take a little ride. You know, oh, says, so well, great. yes, yes, I like a little ride. And so Herb gets Dee Dee in the car. The car starts. This is Key West. And um, he says, well, a little ride, you know. So they start driving up Route 1, the fabled Route 1, you know, <laughs> through the sky practically all the way up the Keys. And, uh, and pretty soon they're on a real trip. And this is where we learn backstories on everybody and their lives and so on. And Dee Dee is not, Dee Dee's had a hard time. Dee Dee is not at all what she seems. But they're having a wonderful trip. And so this is, this is this, you know, he decides to take the, and there he's pregnant too. So, so, you know, all kinds of things are coming up on the thing. So this is the story of this improbable trip and uh, two people I just love so much. So, so did I. Yeah. Uh, I love that. That's awesome. Well, speaking of improbable trips and road trips, you know, we're always curious about the original inkling of a story. And I read that it came to you 
when you were on a drive to Key West. So can you tell Absolutely. us about can you yeah, tell us well, about the origin of the idea? I, yeah, my husband and I have gone to Key West a whole lot and we love it. There's a you know, there's a writer's thing down there every January where we've worked at different times. So anyway, um, about five years ago, we were leaving Key West and we we're getting ready to, you know, drive Route One starts in front of the post office in Key West and it goes up. And so we're we're leaving and we right outside of Key West itself and we saw this first sort of banner sort of electronic thing that came across the highway you know oh, yeah. and it says silver alert and then it has the make and model of a car and then it has call such and such and we said well what is that we've never seen you know we've never seen such a thing and Hal said well I don't know I don't know what it is by the next time we saw it which was about you know 15 miles down the road Silver Alert. He said, you know, it's probably maybe it's like Amber Alert, which is what they put on highways all over the country. You know, if a if a child, a girl, whatever goes missing, he said, but hey, you know, this is Florida. So silver, you know, silver Florida's full of geezers, right? <laughs> you know, you know, geezers. Who says geezers? Yeah. And so, yeah. And, and so he said, so it's probably like geezer on the run. <laughs> Somebody's taking his car from him. He's got his car. You know, he's on the run. And Alternate then, title. He's on, on the run. The run. Exactly. The run. That, saying, that's the okay, sequel. You go, yeah. you go, guy. You know. <laughs> so the next time we saw it, he was just like, yeah, he's still out there. And, uh, you know, and the back then, we go. have imagined the whole, we have imagined more, and we have imagined that he has a companion. And in fact, the companion is the Manny Petty girl from Assisted Living. And so they're, you know, she's always wanted to go to Disney. He's her son. He's pregnant. He's her son. Lee Smith. Oh, it's good to have her. So, so there they are. They're off on the trip. And so it's the first book I have ever written where the plot came first. You know, oh. usually, usually it's the characters and you think about them for a long time and then see what might happen to them. This this is this is what happened, and then I had that to figure awesome. out, you know, okay, who's it going to happen to? What's Herb's backstory? What's Didi, you know, Didi's Didi story? What's Didi's story? Ooh, yeah, so it that. was so much fun to write. I cannot even tell you. I hated yeah. to be done with it. So. <laughs> that was so much fun to read too. Man. Thank you, thank you. Books like that are the best when you're just like having such a good time every morning when you go to your desk. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, it's not always like that. No, I mean, no, not no, usually not. like that. No. And there's some painful moments here because you know aging is really hard and stuff that we're dealing with. And yeah. Dee has had a, a difficult past that yeah. she is, you know, is overcoming and so on and so it, you know, sex trafficking and oh, wow. yeah. yeah. and it's something that I have uh, worked with, been involved with, and so on. And it just is, you know, so, but she has this magic about her, you know, about herself. And she sings. And so oh, she's so magical. Yeah. She's such a little sprite. I kept she imagining is. her yeah. like a very buxom little sprite. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. yeah. Well, Lee, we are obviously fascinated by your characters in Silver Alert, but we are also fascinated by Lee Smith, the writer. So as a North Carolina native and UNC grad, I Oh, that's up, right. Yeah. Of course, hearing all about Lee Smith and reading Lee Smith and being a huge fan of Lee Smith. So this you is very, very kind. <laughs> um, but I would love to know, we would all love to know how you came to writing. I mean, from, you know, the little girl that grew up scribbling stories in the coal mining town of Grundy, Virginia, um, by your 20s, you had already gained a reputation for writing about um, Appalachian lives. So with 13 novels, four story collections and a memoir, um, I am curious, what would you tell that young girl who was burning to tell stories? Um, keep on doing it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, it really, it's, you know, a lot of things are just, just happenstance. I mean, the, the, the family you're born into, the circumstances. In my own case, I was born uh, to a, a couple, an older couple who'd been told they could never have children. So I was like, ta -da! you know, <laughs> if yeah. I, it, I wanted to be an ax murderer. They would have bought me an act. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and so as it was, I was the kind of little girl who just loved to read all the time. And, 
So, and my mother was a home economics teacher. My daddy owned a dime store. And so, um, you know, they just, they bought books. They encouraged me. Daddy, in fact, built me a little writing house down on the banks oh, of the river behind wow. their house. And every time oh, it flooded, he built it back again. Sometimes it oh. would be like a little shed, you know, that he's like he sold in his dime store or he'd, or he'd build a little, a little log cabin one time and so on. And so I was always out there with a million imaginary friends, you oh, know, a whole awesome. town of frogs. They all had names and just oh, writing really. stories from the time I was a child. It was my great, um, it was my great love. And, you know, I, I think later, you know, then I have my own children. And so my boys always had each other to play with and talk to. Yeah. I think a lot of times only children yeah. uh, maybe have the time to pursue this kind of thing. And so yeah. anyway, writing was my writing and reading is just my my great love. And I was lucky enough to uh, to just keep doing it, I guess. Awesome. Oh, and thank God you are. But. That leads directly into this great quote I read from you in Gardening Gun interview. You said, I write fiction the way other people write in their journals. Fiction has always been how I tried to make sense of my own life. And I think everybody on this screen would say the exact same things. And the authors waiting backstage would say the exact same thing. It is how we try to make sense of life. And you said, I am not my characters, but often they're growing through things that I have been through or I'm going through. I want yes. you to tell us a little bit about how you're connected to Herbert and Susan and Dee Dee. Well, um, obviously I am soon going to be 80. I'm 78. And, you know, so all of these questions that are, that have come up for Herb and his beloved wife, Susan, Susan is very much a character in this novel, even though, yep. She, even though by the time it starts, you know, she, she is experiencing Alzheimer's and, but she's very much there. She's very, very, very present. She's, she's quite a figure and was quite a figure and still is. So um, that certainly uh, is, you know, is something that, that was always linked. And then as I say, uh, Dee Dee to me is just uh somebody I care deeply about and about, you know, girls who have, um, who have been mistreated, who have had a tough time and are trying to, are trying to get through it. And it's also, I think, uh, not only about the sex trafficking, which is what Dee Dee has been through, yeah. but it's sort of about, it's about, I mean, I think another thing there is um, literacy is language because, you know, in these situations, you don't have an education. You don't, not only do you not, know how to do anything but you I mean you don't um you know you don't have words you don't have had an education and so on and Dee Dee throughout this this novel is uh she's buying her she's bought herself a a, a book a vocabulary book and she keeps learning new words and she keeps learning new you know new things and so on and so finally you know this is all about language it's all about getting to tell your story and and be who you are claim who you Claim who you can be, you know. Oh my gosh, I love that. That's exactly so I what she's love, I want to see a sequel. Dee Dee. Yeah. Love I want to see I want a DD sequel. I want a DD sequel. <laughs> I do too. Yeah. I, I love DD so much. So that, that, that'll be the the geezer book, whatever it was, right? Like the the, the <laughs> escape, driving with geezers or whatever. <laughs> I, love that. I love that word. <laughs> you know, but I think writing really, I mean, it does. It's it's so wonderful. I mean, I'm a reader, 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 above yeah. all things. I think I'd be a reader rather than a writer. If I had to, had to choose, I'd just read because I can't stand not to read. But writing itself is a way, you know, for us to work through yeah. a lot of these things that we have on our minds, you know, Absolutely. and I think we, we certainly do that. It's, it's so true. But, you know, speaking of that reader-writer connection, in our newsletter, you talked about writing the first draft of your novel's longhand on yellow legal pads. Yeah. And you also chat about being a teacher. So we would love yeah. a writing tip from you. Do you have one piece of advice you love to give to emerging writers who've shown up in your classroom? Oh, um, no, I think it kind of <laughs> depends on them. You know, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm so interested in them. 
And it, after talking to them, I, I think you can see a way. Each each person is so very different. I yeah. think if you have a sort of a recipe, you know, that everyone should do, that's maybe oh, not, that. not, you know, not. So I don't know. I try to talk to them a while and see where they're coming from and, and what interests them and what kind of things they, they want to write and, you know, and why they're in the class, why they're in the class. You know, oh, what Lee, they, I wish you'd been my what, teacher. What do you read? What do you love? You know, yeah. what do you read is a big thing. Cause I think I'm really a reader first rather, you know, and I read all you guys too. I just, you know, it's, um, that's what, I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't live if I couldn't read. So. Yeah. That's so true. I love that. Yeah. Lee, my goodness, I loved this book and we have loved having you. And if you would like to talk about a DD sequel, you can just give me a ring. <laughs> talk about it because I have some ideas. But thank you so much for joining us. Um, you have so many admirers on this show among the hosts and the viewers. And it has been a pleasure meeting you even virtually. Well, I admire all of y'all and I appreciate being on here. I really do. And uh, thanks. You know, I'm, I'm happy to be along for the ride as Dee Dee always says. <laughs> as Dee Dee always says. Along for the ride on this show. This is cool. <laughs> thank you. All right, Miss Lee. Yeah, thank, thank you, you Lee. for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, y'all. Our Before we bring on Kate Morton, um, and get to talk about homecoming. We want to remind you about our Writer's Block podcast. You have been listening, haven't you? I'm pointing mm -hmm. my finger. You better be listening. A new episode drops every Friday on all major podcasting platforms. We will always post a link to the newest episode on the Friends in Fiction Facebook page and Instagram feed. On our most recent episode, Out Now, Ron and Mary Alice Monroe, our original co-founder with us, they talked to Kristen Ness about her debut novel, At Loggerheads. I'm going to only give you one guess what the book is about. <laughs> and then, coming when Mary Friday, Alice comes back for it, you, you're, it's a pretty you good. No, it's about turtles. <laughs> um, <laughs> no doubt. And coming this Friday, Mary Kay Andrews and Ron will be talking to James Comey. Yes. That James Comey, the former <laughs> FBI cool. director, about his debut thriller called Central Park West. And Mary Kay talked to us about it, and she loved the book. She thought it was just a really wild ride. So listen, review, subscribe, and share with a friend if you like what you hear. And don't and now, forget, I, I was going to say, don't forget oh. after Kate Morton, we have an after show with the incredible Susan Meisner mm -hmm. to talk about her newest novel too. So we've got plenty more in store for you tonight. We're so excited. Absolutely. And we got to talk to Susan a little bit before the show and you do not want to miss our conversation. So without further ado, let's welcome Kate Morton. I am unabashedly telling you that Kate Morton has been one of my favorite authors for years. She is the award-winning, internationally best-selling author of several novels, including The Forgotten Garden, The Distant Hours, The Secret Keeper, The Lake House, and The Clockmaker's Daughter. And I will second the fact you've been talking about her for years. This isn't just a yes. nice thing you're saying now. I know yeah. you really are a big yeah. supporter Huge and fan, fan of her work. Yep. So Kate's books have been published in 38 languages across 45 territories and have all been number one bestsellers around the world. So her book, The House at Riverton, was one of the most successful UK debuts of all time. Wow. Me too. <laughs> same, <laughs> same, same, same. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, Kate grew up in the mountains of Southeast Queensland and now lives with her family in London and Australia. Well, you know, she and MKA could have like just hooked up for this. They could have. I know, but she's in Australia right now. Oh, so. okay. All right. She has degrees in dramatic art and English literature. Her newest novel, Homecoming, was just released last month and was an instant New York Times bestseller and an immersive read that I cannot shake. So, Sean, can you bring Kate on? Hi, Kate. Hi, Kate. <laughs> Hi everybody. <laughs> you did it. You made it on. I did it. Here I am. <laughs> it's so good watching, to be with you. Oh, so good to have you. For everybody watching, it Kate is in Australia, so it is 9 o'clock in the morning <laughs> for Kate while we are, are here in the evening. So... Kate, I'm so sorry our Mary Kay isn't here because she is a huge fan of your work and she loves old houses with the same devotion 
that you do. So she <laughs> sends her love and hello. Oh, I send mine right back to her. <laughs> All right, let's dive into this novel, Homecoming. So this is a generational mystery, a novel about a shocking crime of the Turner family in a small town of Tambilla, a deeply buried secret, and a journalist in search of a story. But Kate, can you tell us more about this novel and then what you think it's really about? Yeah, that's such a good question, isn't it? Because, of course, you can give the plot summary, which um, yes. I always love when someone else does, because I find, I don't know if you agree, but I always think that's one of the most difficult questions because... And awkward. You're com don't, don't you think? I, I don't have a very good elevator pitch <laughs> for my books. I never do at the beginning and even at the end of it. Um, I guess it's the difficulty of compressing... 150,000 words into 20 neat ones. Uh, so thank you for <laughs> giving a small summary. Uh, it starts with a, well, there's a prologue set in 1959, but I'm going to skip that for a second. It starts with a young woman who lives in London, an Australian, and when I say young, she's about 40. So I, I think we'll let that be young. Uh, we'll living in young. London. <laughs> yeah, she's a journalist, she's Australian, and she receives the call that no expat ever wants to receive, but always fears they'll, they'll have, which is news uh, from Australia that her beloved grandmother has suffered a serious fall and is now in hospital. Uh, so she hops on a flight, uh, heads back to Australia. Uh, in her own life, she's reached a sort of a, um, an impasse in her career, in her personal life. And so she's sort of kicking around in her grandmother's beautiful old house um, on Sydney Harbour uh, when she uh, comes across an, an old book of true crime, uh, which interests her because it's an interesting book. But also as she reads, she starts to realise that it might hold a key to a secret in her own family's past and something related to her grandmother and indeed the, the fall that her grandmother has suffered. So, no, Chill that's the, <laughs> yeah I, I need the uh, sound effect um so that's Ba-boom. that's the plot what's it really about um i think what it's really about and the, the clue is in the, the title uh something i think about a lot something i was thinking about an awful lot at the beginning of the genesis of this novel in particular is home and belonging and what it means when we say that we feel at home are we talking about a place or is it something more intrinsic than that and that's the question that this book tries to answer uh, did it i'm not sure i think as a person i still wonder um i still play with those ideas so i don't know if i've quite got there yet that's well, awesome th that's interesting that you say that about thinking about home and belonging because I was also going to ask I, I read that you'd started it started writing the book at the beginning of the pandemic when you returned from London to Australia and you said I was thinking a lot about home and belonging and what it means to come home and during uncertain times the manuscript the world of the book became a home of sorts for me which mm -hmm. I love that I mean it kind of gives a double meaning to the title on top of everything within the book so can you talk to us a little bit about the origin of the novel Yes, of course. Um, as you as you say, uh, I started having the ideas for Homecoming at um, sort of early in the first half of 2020, uh, when the pandemic started. You know, which seems a long time ago now, but it was March 2020. My family and I were living in London, and it all started to snowball, as you'll remember. And we had a flight booked back to Australia at Easter. But flights were starting to be cancelled. Then my children's schools all went online. And we, we started to think if we don't go now, we might not see our family for a while. And they were all back in Australia. So we hopped on a flight and had the most strange and discombobulating 24-hour flight of my life. I mean, it's always quite discombobulating to fly that far and across so many time zones. But this was yeah. particularly weird because there were people in hazmat suits and flights were oh, wow. dropping off the board at each airport we flew through. Um, we, our temperature was taken at least four times as we tra you know, transversed through different airports. We actually worried we wouldn't make it home. It yeah. was that kind of strange, stressful experience. Anyway, we arrived home and we'd left the, the grey and the grim and the late winter of London and landed in late summer in Australia 
and where we happened to be was a family farm so it was rural the sunlight was so bright the grasses mm -hmm. were that late summer silver um and in the where we were deposited out of the taxi with all our suitcases um the roses in the rose garden were heavy headed and there were cherry tomatoes oh. sown wild through and it the smell of the air and the heat was so different that it was very um, dislocating and as uh, we thought we'd be there for maybe a month and then the pandemic would end and we'd all go back and resume our life but of course as we all know that's not what happened and it was in that strange period when the whole rest of the world was spinning and changing and where we were felt like this uh, sort of the center that, that you hope will hold, the still point of the turning yeah. world, as T.S. Eliot calls it. And so I was very, um, it's like my, um, all of those senses that we use to decode the world and notice it were switched up to, you know, 11. Everything was brighter and I, I noticed things that are so familiar to me because this is my home country, but I saw them as if for the first time. And the book that I've been writing, which was set in Europe, started to feel so... Uh, distanced, not just geographically, but I couldn't connect. I couldn't find the life and soul of it anymore. And meanwhile, the the my immediate surrounds, the thoughts about home and what it means to come home, and in such strange circumstances, really started to come alive. And I started to, as you will all uh, be familiar with that process, when characters and settings and situations and plots start to suggest themselves and almost conjure themselves to life, so that before I knew it. The world of this new story uh, had 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 gained its own um, heart, and it was the one that I I had to follow. That's awesome. That. It is like pure magic when that happens. I think it's right. Oh keeps just coming back to the page that moment where you're writing and writing, and all of a sudden you're like, "Wait, I never thought of that. What's going on?" Yes. <laughs> I love those moments. Um, well, Kate, um, I I have to throw my hat in and say that I also absolutely love and adore old houses. Um, and they're very, very special. So um, that really interests me about your work as well. So from The Clockmaker's Daughter, where the house literally speaks to us, to this novel and the house in Tambilla, you bring us into the world of a house and a place that isn't just brick, stone, and mortar. So in our newsletter, you even said, I wrote some truly terrible poems during my teenage years. And in a box of old papers, I found the start of a Harlequin romance in which I spent an inordinate amount of time describing the main character's old house. <laughs> That's and awesome. I was like, I feel so seen right now because it's I feel so seen. <laughs> my editors will be like, not everyone is as interested in like the intricacies of this room as you are. <laughs> this has obviously been an obsession of yours since at least childhood. So do you have a house that feels this way to you? Um, yeah, a number of houses. As you say, it, this has been from childhood and I, I'm, I'm not sure why exactly. I know my mom used to sit up in bed with graph paper drawing uh, floor plans for houses. So wow. Wow. she loves them. And, and I've known how to read floor plans for a long time. I can, <laughs> I can visualize the house <laughs> quite easily. Wow. On weekends, we would go and look around houses um, it, that my parents would take us. And I even loved that, you know, that it's the same as, uh, you know, when there's a new hotel room, I love entering and exploring and seeing the way they've managed to fit, you know, cupboards and stairwells. I, I do love all of that. Um, architecture. So there's that love, but it's also the way, um, hang on, brief technical moment. It, it's also, <laughs> so there's the architectural level, but there's also the status that houses have in our lives as um, repositories, places where human beings live out their existences, that families are there. And that idea that the walls hold secrets is one that I've always, um, yeah. I, I've always been keyed into. And one of the first houses I can remember was uh, when I was a little girl uh, and I learned that we were going to go and live on a place called Tambourine Mountain. Um, my parents, I guess the way you do with children, sort of tried to sell me on this idea. It's a mountain and, you know, cause it was quite a long way away. And I really, you know, I can remember drawing a picture of a hill with one house on the top, which is how I envisaged it. It's a little different from that. It's actually a plateau in southeast Queensland in the subtropics. 
And so to get there, you drive up from the sort of scrappy bush of the flatland up the mountain, and it's about 500 meters up. And as you go up, you that the bush transitions into rainforest and you start to hear whip birds and the running water of um, waterfalls and, and streams and creeks. And so up we go up into this sort of land in the clouds almost. And the first morning we arrived, I was four years old and the house we were renting, you had to drive down a long driveway through paddocks. And then suddenly there it was, and it was an old weatherboard wooden house the paint had long since fallen off the uh, chamfer boards on the outside. And on the morning we arrived, this is quite ordinary on Tambourine Mountain, but it was very new to us. Clouds were streaming through, as it seemed from one window, through the house and out the other side. It really was up there in, in the clouds. And so that was, I think, the first time a house made an impression on me as um, something more than just the place where we were going to live. It, it seemed to have its own character and personality that day. Mm -hmm. oh. I feel like I'm at story time. Like, we're all like, keep talking. In. We're all leaning in. Like, <laughs> just keep talking. A more. comment just came in from Cindy Jo Riddle. It says, I love Kate's descriptions. I can see it, hear it, and smell it. <laughs> which is so nice and somebody just reminded me i meant to say this jackie key barnett said the audiobook is brilliantly read by claire foy um and i claire foy, wow. totally agree because i listened to half of it on audio and read the other half and um for those of you who don't remember claire foy played the queen and um she's just amazing she but is, yeah. i want to talk about stories and books because it's my jam <laughs> and stories and books permeate soak and are everywhere in this novel from Percy's polio bedridden immersion in books to Jess and Nora's love of them to the emotional connection between two people falling in love over books books are at the heart and you have done the same with other novels even with the mud man in the distant hours so I want you, if you can, to talk to us about the power of books, not only for your characters, but also for you. That's such a great question. And of course, I feel exactly the same way as, yeah. as all of you. Um, I was in your, your previous conversation um, with Lee Smith, I, I was listening and nodding along when you were all speaking about you know, that coming to writing through this love of reading. And that is my story too. Um, so including those layers in my books, it's not even a conscious choice. I, I find that that love of books and the written word and stories, uh, I mean, what are we if not, you know, the, the sum total of all the stories we've ever been told or told ourselves? And, and that sense is so intrinsic to my understanding of the world and of people that it's not even a choice uh, to, to um, thread those ideas through my books. It, it just happens. And certainly I was I was that kind of child. I, I learned to read, I'm the first of three. And so my mum was very zealous about teaching me how to read. So I knew how to read before I went to school. Uh, so I, I, my earliest memories are of, you know, being called, you know, late for school and sort of trying to finish the reread that I was doing of my, my favorite book of the, at the time. So I, I've always read um, long before I even thought about writing or, or even knew that writers were people. Um, my way of understanding the world, of learning about the world, of th that sense, I mean, it's such, it sounds so trite to say that um, books are your friends and you're never alone if you have a book, but it's true, mm -hmm. it really is. I was just reordering my bookcase yesterday because um, I accumulate so many books and I loathe to ever let go of them, but I decided it was time to send some to, to new homes mm -hmm. and I was ordering them. And it really is like going um, back in time through, a, you know, the layers or like an ar archaeological dig almost yeah. through the layers of my own life and the, the things that have interested me at different times mm -hmm. and that have, uh, you know, there's that sort of osmotic flow between who you are as a person and what you're reading and writing and and i love that that the way books do come to tell our our stories and if you dig back far enough you can see all those layers of of yourself and your life's journey 
Ah, that's such a good point. Speaking of journeys, I'm curious how you journey through a novel that you're writing. So the plotting here is so intricate, so absolutely page turning while you unveil the truth. So I know, you know, we often talk about our process and how we, how we get from start to finish when we're writing a book. So we're wondering, are you a plotter or a pantser, or as Neil <laughs> Gaiman would say it, a gardener or an architect? Can you tell us a little <laughs> bit about your process? Yeah, I really like the gardener and architect um, <laughs> metaphor, I suppose because I love uh, both of those things. Yes. Um, I'm a bit of both. Okay. When I first started out, I was very much an architect. Um, I clung to the, the plan that I'd drawn. And when I would, um, you know, go out for the day and I'd see things and I think, oh, that, that would go really well in this scene. That's, a, that's an idea. I'd go home and write it and then I'd really second guess myself and think, but that wasn't part of the plan. What if I've taken it in the wrong direction? What if it turns into the wrong book? Uh, you know, I had the plan and I had the idea and now, ooh, now I understand that, of course, books are, manuscripts are alive. And, and th that is what you're, you know, you're supposed to, as, an, as a creator, as an artist, you're supposed to have your antennae out. And when you open uh, yeah. an idea, so, you know, till the soil as, as to take the Neil Gaiman metaphor and, and start planting yeah. things in it. If you're out and about and you find new ideas, you, you, you are more aware of them and they belong in there because each, um, manuscript is a time capsule of the author's life uh, that everything they see and think and feel and do during the process of writing it finds a way of it, 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 and perhaps not literally but it does find a way of expressing itself in the work and now being so much further down the line i love that idea i love that they're alive and that they do but you are in dialogue with your own work and i think that's something that readers can tell as well if you've allowed yourself the, the freedom to be um, authentic, to be truthful, to yeah. to put the ideas in as they come, and let let you know trust the manuscript to to grow in the direction that it, that it's meant to grow in. Absolutely, I Can love you... being in dialogue with your own work. I yeah. love that. I'm going to yeah. write that down. Christy, will you pull one of the live questions for us? Yes, I will. Kate, okay, we have so many questions coming in for you, and we can't get to all of them, unfortunately. <laughs> but I'm picking Robin Shelley's question because I have the same question. So uh, this, is, this, <laughs> this, is for, this is for Robin, but it's for me, too. So she wants to know, where did the idea for the true crime book connecting to the plot come from? I love that. Gosh, it can be so hard to remember. I, I always feel very I disappointing. Do you, do you find that you get yes. asked and you think, gosh, I, d I don't know. I was, <laughs> I, you're so. I have no idea. In, yeah. Yeah. I know. You're so in the process and those antennae are up. And so when the ideas come, you, you don't signpost it. it. You have to sort of look back from far down the line now and say, no, I wonder what it was that, that first put that idea there. Uh, but I do remember it wasn't at the very beginning. I didn't know it was going to be there uh, from the start. It was perhaps um, maybe six months into the process. And when I first had the idea, because my books are always about uh, layers of time and the way time intersects and, and the haunting of the present by the past, I'm always looking for ways to tell the historical storyline that are authentic, but also new and interesting to me as a writer and, and also that ring true to the type of book I want to tell I mean for instance in Homecoming to give a first person recollection of what happened I would, would be very limited in the characters I could choose and you know the character Nora who who was alive both in the, the present and the past storyline is unable to tell us she's 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 not well she's in hospital she's not really able to tell her story in the way that I needed her to. And I didn't want only Nora's perspective. So I had to think about other ways. And when I came up with the idea of the, the true crime book, uh, because I do love that idea that um, we think we know what happened in certain historical situations, but do we really? And, and of course, that's, you know, some, that, that was of great interest to me. So this seemed the perfect way to tell a version of events that I could then question in the present and when i started i thought great you know here we go i'll, I'll begin the historical um it, it i had the enjoyment of being able to write from slightly more of a distance which is different from my own style of writing i, I like 
uh, I tend to write as a very, very close third person, you know, where you, you as the reader, even though you're reading he, she, they, you, you are very much experiencing it with them, with the character. Whereas uh, the true crime book is written at slightly more of a journalistic distance. And I enjoyed that challenge. But I didn't get far into it before I realized, oh, this is just one person's point of view. I'm going to be able to have a lot more fun with this true crime novel uh, by having my my present day character start to question some of the assumptions that were made at the time. That's fascinating. I love that. Well, I love when a solution pops up that has yes. was already hidden inside the story. Oh, if we pay attention, I. it was yes. already in there. Isn't it strange how the, how often that happens? And I, I suppose it's your unconscious. I don't know. I mean, some people would say it's it's the magic, it's the universe. But so often I find I've written things just because I liked them. They interested me. They felt as if they belonged. So they've, they've gone in there in the beginning. And at the ending, when I'm looking for a way to effect a change or to make something happen I realized that it, it's it's already there already you know there. you wrote it 12 months ago yes it's, it's, crazy. Crazy. it's such an incredible feeling so incredible. yeah it's so that incredible. murky subconscious of ours back there doing its job it's like you've already given yeah. yourself a road map and you didn't even see it yeah. <laughs> yes I sometimes oh. think that's part of part of our challenge is learning to to trust the, the unconscious to trust more, to, yeah. to switch off the the correcting part of our brain and just just you know let it do its thing. It's wise. It's it wise and scary sometimes. Yeah. Well, Kate, you have been such an incredible guest, and I know we have so much more to talk about. But before we let you go, is there anything that you have read and loved lately? Because I know in our newsletter you talked about a couple being such a reader. We'd love to know, get one good book wreck before we let you go. Yes, in, in the newsletter, I mentioned Sorrow and Bliss by Meg Mason, which I really, really loved and I have recommended to so many people. Um, I, I think she manages, uh, the voice in the book is has a similar, um, it reminded me a bit of Nancy Mitford, witty, but, but beneath mm -hmm. the wit, so moving and able mm -hmm. to be happy and sad at the same time, which I think is such an art. Uh, so I loved that. But I also, um, I'm a very eclectic reader. So I read across all genres. Uh, I love nonfiction. But another fiction that I read recently was Station Eleven by um, Emily St. John Mandel, yeah. which I, I, I must admit, I went the reverse uh, direction. I watched the series and I was halfway through and I was so intoxicated by it that I ran and, and bought everything she's ever written. See, I'm a, I'm a oh, writer's amazing. dream reader. <laughs> and I read it and I just loved it. It's such, I, I had read um, a description saying, um, you know, this is a, a, a post-pandemic novel that's hopeful. And I thought, goodness, that sounds, you know, a, a hopeful dystopian novel. I, I've got to read this. But it, it, the writing is so beautiful. And it's, even though it does take place in a, a a world that's post pandemic, much worse than the pandemic we all endured, uh, where civilization really has, um, as we know, it has ground to a halt and people are having to, to sort of restart everything. But it within that world, it celebrates, um, it uses Shakespeare and theater as a means to explore what it is to be a human and to find hope and to find community and togetherness in a world that seems to be um, absent of those things. And I just loved it. What a beautiful writer. So I highly recommend it. I loved that book too. I read it oh, years good. ago though. And you reminded me of it. That's fantastic. Well, Kate, <laughs> thank you so much for coming. You have been such a delight and we're so glad you spent your morning and our evening with us. And you can send us a note later and tell us what's going on in the future. Because you're already in tomorrow. So. I will. I mean, it's looking a little hazy here, but, but okay. so far, so okay. good. Thank you for having me. I love being part of this group. Thank oh, you. You're a delight, my friends. You. Thank it's you. Wonderful. All right, y'all. We will see you in a few seconds because we have a killer after show with Susan Meisner. But remember that you can find all of our back episodes on YouTube. We'll be back next week with Meg Mitchell Moore, Victoria Benton Frank, yes, the daughter of Dorothea Benton Frank, 
also with Audrey Beleza and Emily Harden, who will join us for the after show. So we have such a fun episode in store for you. And we'll see you in a couple seconds at the after show with Susan Meisner. Yay. Thank you for tuning in. You can join us every week on Facebook or YouTube, where our live show airs on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Also, subscribe to our podcast and follow us on Instagram. We're so glad you're here. Welcome back, everybody. <laughs> For that 30 seconds. Oh, my gosh. They were both so interesting. Fantastic. Oh gosh. Both of them for an hour each. And I, I kept thinking, I bet Susan wants to ask a question. I bet Susan I know, wants to ask a question. Oh, she's so on. I know. Fun. I just thought of that because she's such a fan of both of their works. But mm. let's dive in with Susan Meisner. So I know most of y'all know her. She's a huge fan favorite. But Susan Meisner is a USA Today bestselling author of historical fiction with more than three quarters of a million books in readers' hands and translations in 18 languages. Mm. Her novels include The Nature of Fragile Things, one of my favorites, which earned a starred review in Publishers Weekly, The Last Year of the War, named to Real Simple Magazine's list of best books for 2019, As Bright as Heaven, which earned a starred review in Library Journal, Secrets of a Charmed Life, a Goodreads finalist for Best Historical Fiction in 2015, and A Fall of Marigold, named to book list top 10 women's fiction titles for 2014. Susan, get it. And of course, she visited (laughs) with us in the fall to talk about When We Had Wings, which she co-wrote with Christina McMorris. 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 We just gave her a nickname. Uh, Yeah, there he is. And Ariel Lahan. She's also a speaker and writing workshop leader with a background in community journalism. She attended Point Loma Nazarene University in California and now makes her home with her husband in Yellow Lab in the Pacific Northwest. Her newest novel, Only the Beautiful, was just released. I love it. I think that's the best cover. gorgeous, yeah. I love all her covers, but that one is amazing. So pretty. Um, Sean, can you bring Susan on so we can talk to her instead of about her? (laughs) (laughs) Hi, Hi, Susan. Susan. I'm so happy to be back with you guys. And that interview with those two gals was amazing. I'm entranced. That was amazing. Great, right, right? That was the exact like word minute. that I just used. It was entranced. Yes. When I was yeah. like. <laughs> For like a minute there, I forgot we were supposed to be interviewing. And I was just like. Yeah, tell us. Yeah. Yeah, I, exactly. I do have to make the comment, though, before we dive in, that um, I remember being stuck in an airport, like kind of pandemic ish time and there were no rental cars and I was there for like a million hours and you guys kept texting me and you were like do you think you're in like station 11 and I was like thanks guys this is really (laughs) this is really helpful this is really good friends (laughs) are you stuck in the airport all right Susan we're so excited to talk about only the beautiful so it is about a young mother's fight to keep her daughter and the winds of fortune that tear them apart. It is set in both 1938 California and 1947 Europe. And I know you talked to us about this book when you dropped in last fall with Christina McMorrissey (laughs) (laughs) and Ariel, but I would love to have you tell us not just what the book is about, but like we asked the other two, what it's really about. Yeah, just like Kate, I really have a hard time distilling the book into just like some really wonderful, would she say, 20 20 wonderful words. But I guess if I had to boil it down, it's a book about what happens when people who have power and control start operating out of the ideology that some humans are just better humans than others. And um, it's about a movement in history. We don't hear much about it anymore. It's the eugenics movement. And that's pretty much what that movement was all about, was masterminding the collective gene pool, yeah. which if that scares you a little bit, it, it should. We saw exactly where that kind of thinking goes in um, Nazi-occupied Europe during World War II. So it's about that. But I have to tell people right from the get-go that even though I deal with some really difficult subject matter, it made me cry many times as I was writing I provided, I hope for you, 
a story that has lots of redemptive qualities about it. So I don't want you to think that it's always going to be sad, even though I keep it true. I keep it real for you. It's my promise to you as a historical fiction writer, but there's a lot of hope and light in the book. Yeah, absolutely. Like, will you do that with all your books? You take us through some of the things that are the hardest in our lives and um, bring us out to show us the, the light in all of that. But like so many books set in the 1930s and 1940s, this one feels surprisingly relevant, mm-hmm. even for today. So do you see parts of the eugenics movement, or at least the mindset that led to that movement, still reverberating through our world today? And maybe for those who don't know what the word eugenics means, maybe kind of explain mm-hmm what that is and how it might still reverberate today? Sure. Well, eugenics is a word that's just the combination of two Greek, I guess, root words. And the word you, E-U, means good. So like when you give a eulogy at someone's funeral, you're giving good words about the person. And um, gene genetics is all about our heredity. So put those two words together. It's like good genes, good heredity. And to accomplish that, this, the thinking was, well, we only want certain kinds of people to be born, which means we only want certain kinds of people to have children. And, wow. uh, and, we, and we want to have healthy, healthy, happy, wonderful children, which is not um, ideologically, that's not a bad thing to want healthy children to be yeah. born. That's, that's a wonderful thing. But that doesn't always happen. Yeah. And to um, start operating out of this thought process that if you're born with any kind of deformity, or a difference or anomaly that you're less human, you're less valuable, you have no reason to be here and there should be no more people like you born on the planet. That's pretty much what that, what that means to take eugenic thinking to its zenith is to weed out what's not desirable, what's not beautiful, just get rid of it. Wow. Well, speaking of the story feeling so relevant, Susan, I was actually surprised to hear um, about eugenics here in the United States. So I think many of us are aware that it was a core part of Hitler's beliefs. Mm -hmm. So can you talk to us a bit about Carrie Buck and how her story helped inspire the book? And why do you think that this part of history is not as commonly known? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Carrie Buck, in fact, I have a picture of her. This is her and her mom. The picture's kind of glossy, but this is Carrie and her mom. She was born in Virginia in 1906, and I don't often tell the story of a real person in history. I'm, I, my hat goes off to every historical fiction author that can do that. I've always had um, fictional characters inhabiting the real world, and Carrie Buck's story has never been told. I could have told it, but it's just so sad. Um, everything I just told you about happened to her. She was living at a time when powerful people could decide who could have children and who could not. And she was um, labeled feeble-minded, which she wasn't. She was labeled um, sexually promiscuous, which she wasn't. She was raped um, by her foster family's nephew. And um, she was put into an institution because her mother had been institutionalized and they wanted to sterilize her. And um, they decided to um, make a case study out of her um, particular case because they wanted to make sure that constitutionally they could do this. Lots of states were wondering, we're doing this, but will it hold up in court? So they had Carrie's case go all the way to the Supreme Court in appeals. And the Supreme Court heard the case uh, with the worst kind of evidence. Um, they, her, even her school records weren't brought into the courtroom. And they decided, yes, she's feeble-minded, just like her mother, eight to one decision to sterilize her. Oh. And, and, and that, that gave the green light for all the states. 32 states had these same laws on the books. To, um, to forcibly sterilize people who are in state institutions for whatever reason, um, um, without their knowledge or consent. And, uh, and so I couldn't tell her story because it was so sad. She got out um, still in her childbearing years and um, that she was sterilized. And the one child she did have because that the rape resulted in a child, um, her daughter, who was given to that same foster family to raise, had, had died of a disease um, young, and so she was never able to have children. And and that that to me was just too sad a story to tell. I wanted to make sure that I could give you a story where there had been hope infused in there somehow. Yeah. And um, so that's Carrie Buck's story. There's a really good book called Imbeciles 
by Adam Cohen, C-O-H-E-N. It was, it's a phenomenal book. It's pretty much her story and also um, how her story could even have happened. Like, how did it even happen? It's a wonderful book if this topic interests you. Awesome. Well, um, Susan, I know, I think we've talked about this a little bit before, but why is it so important to you to bring these lesser known pieces of history to the forefront? Yeah, I think it's because, um, like you said, um, we don't hear much about this anymore. And uh, you're wondering why do certain stories like this fall by the wayside? And part of it is, is that we, you know, we choose to remember what we want to remember. And I know the past is important to us. It truly is. We wouldn't have museums if it wasn't. But I think we like to be selective with what we retain, what we remember. And, and it could just be that we don't want to remember the mistakes. You know, you make a bad mistake and you're like, well, let's just shut the door on that and move forward. But the trouble with that, of course, is if you forget your mistakes, then you're, you're apt to repeat them. And so for me, if I come across a story that I feel like is, was impactful to humanity, but we're forgetting it, that to me kind of speaks story to me because... I think historical fiction is uniquely positioned to keep the past alive and in the best way because it's it's experiential. I, I can bring you back into the past to the real world, real people lived in it, have you experience it and bring you safely back to your living room or your bedroom. And not many, not many books can do that, but historical fiction can. And it allows us, I think, to revisit the past, even our mistakes, so that we can learn from them and bring our knowledge of the past into our present, which of course we're charting the future even as we live the present. And eugenic thinking is, the eugenic movement is done. All of the states that had those laws, they've all rescinded them. It took a while. Some of them had them on for as late as the 19, um, 1990s and even into the 2000s. Um, so the eugenic movement, those laws are no longer in place, but eugenic thinking, this idea that some people are better than others, I'm afraid that that's part of um, the makeup of, of us. We, we tend to think um, and, and prejudge and look at somebody who is different and make a value judgment. And because we're kind of wired that way, we need to remember these mistakes so we don't repeat them. Mm -hmm. We don't repeat them. It's true. Yeah, so absolutely. Well, Susan, before we let you go, we would love to hear what you're working on next. We know you always uncover pieces of history that we don't know enough about. I mean, I, I think you're just doing such a great job kind of blazing trails in these spaces that, that, are, that are untapped and telling these stories that are untold. So do you have another book in the works now that you can tell us a little I bit about? I do. Um, I'm actually doing two things at once, which I don't recommend, but I, it's, it's going to be good. Okay. Oh, I can't do that. I can't yeah, do that. Right. So the, my next standalone novel, um, I, I'm just in the rough draft stages of it. It doesn't have a title yet, and it is kind of up there in the clouds. I'm trying to wrangle it down where I am. But it is um, set post-World War II, and we've had so many great World War II books come out lately, a lot. Oh, and it, it occurred to me that people might be wondering, well, what was the world like after World War II? And so, like, what were the 1950s like? It, aside from having the best cars and the best music ever, <laughs> what were they like? And, like, was it a time of great prosperity and peace after the horrors of war? And what I'm finding is, no, it wasn't. It was a, actually a time of great fear. And it's because a new war began right away from the get-go. As soon as World War II ended, the Cold War began. And it was a real deal. It was a war of fear and ideals and um, the bomb and everyone was afraid of the bomb. Everyone was afraid of um, the USSR. And so the fifties were kind of difficult and people were afraid that they were gonna lose what mattered most to them, which was home. And, um, and so it deals with that. And it also deals with, um, you know, there are a million displaced persons after World War II. It's an actual proper noun, DP, displaced persons. And oh, these people- that. Yeah, it's it's a, it was a real deal. There were displaced persons camps all over Germany. A lot of Eastern Europeans had been brought in as forced labor for the Nazi regime. And when the war ended, a lot of those Eastern European countries became um, Soviet occupied and Soviet run. And so to go home meant to go home to a world that you that was not it was not the world you left. So even if you could go home to a home that still was still standing it was not the home you left. And a lot of people, many of them did not want to go back home because they did not want to live under Soviet rule. 
And so America brought in 200,000 DPs under a special visa and we gave, we gave them asylum, if you will. And so it's about one of those people. It's, it's a fictionalized version of one of those 200,000 people that America brought in because um, that they, they weren't in danger of losing their home. They'd already lost it. So I guess because it's a story really about it's about, well, what do you do when your home has been taken from you or it looks like it could it could be taken from you at any moment? How do you recapture your sense of belonging yeah. when it seems like it's just made of paper and it's about to blow away? Oh, I love oh, that. Wow. Oh, and I have a children's book. Can I read book. that tomorrow? Oh, you have a children's book? Oh, you have a children's book. book. Yes, this this comes out. It's a it's a picture book, and the um, illustrations are adorable. And it's about ah. at the zoo. And you know what? Nobody cries in here. Ah. You won't need ah. to. You won't That's need to. Awesome. Yeah. But it's a book about. Um, it's an enrichment exercise that lots of zoos put on for their animals in October. They give their animals pumpkins for their habitats and let them play with them and eat them. And everyone loves Pumpkin Day at the zoo. So it comes out in July. Oh, so oh my gosh, gosh that's Susan, so that's awesome. It was so fun to write. And the best thing about it is it is all fun. No tears, I promise. Oh, I I'm going to pre-order that. that right this second for my Susan, little ones. So. if you have advanced copies, you'll have to send me one because I'm doing it. Oh my goodness, I'm, yes. I, yes. I would love it. But my Absolutely. first week of tour, I'm actually doing an event at the Cape May County Zoo in New Jersey. But like, but they bring authors in. So I would love to hand deliver that book to them and be like, Absolutely. you have to have her. Okay. Oh, oh, that'd be so much fun. I'll drop it in the mail tomorrow. Perfect. Great. Oh, <laughs> oh I love Great. it. Well, Susan, thank you so much for being with us. We love talking to you every single time. And to all of you out there, don't forget to look for Susan's Only the Beautiful on bookshop.org or wherever books are sold. Mm -hmm. And join us next week as we welcome Meg Mitchell-Moore, Victoria Benton-Frank, Audrey Beleza, and Emily Harden. Susan, thank you so much for coming. Thanks. Susan. Thank you for having me. Always, always a pleasure. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.